Underground. Underground. Ladies and gentlemen, the weekend. <laughs> Can help us tonight. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty fucking loud, yeah. That, that's, that's what you want, right? You want them to be screaming. They're pretty good with like control, though. You can control them. Welcome, all first and last time listeners, to the Basement Podcast. Uh, shit, this isn't even really the Basement Podcast. This is the Basement Underground. underground. Woo! We live from the underground for the first time. So in this series, we're going to be analyzing some very critically well-received and some of out of, kind of out of the public eye, uh, pieces of music, TV, movies, culture, essentially um and just analyzing it and breaking down how it was made and just you know talking about its impact on us and the culture in general uh so it's new haven't done it before uh but you know uh we will, we'll see where it goes uh see how it but, goes man yeah for those of you who haven't seen the man with the crazy background before this is trey <laughs> trey say what up to the listeners yeah it was good y'all Gucci gang, baby. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast, dude. It's um, it's very nice to be a part of something like this. I haven't done this um, properly before. So um, I'm keen to start. Yeah, uh, Trey is going to be with us we're to every on every edition of The Basement Underground. So, you know, if you don't like his face, you best get used to it. <laughs> but what's there not to love? Yeah, I'll turn off my camera. God damn. <laughs> Making me feel shy and shit. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 you know I'm just messing with you, you know I'm just messing with you, uh, but yeah, no, nah, so let's get started, all right, uh, Trey, yeah. mm-hmm. before we get into the album, I need to ask you, where were you in 2011? 2011, you're looking at um, four foot five Trey, uh, I think I was like... I don't want to say like I was an outcast. I mean, I was lucky in the sense that I was the funny guy. So, I mean, like people couldn't really bully me. Um, but I mean, obviously at the time, 2011, that was a very big um, year when it came to like my height. That's when I realized like people, they pay attention to that type of stuff. It was, um, yeah, it was a pretty tough year. But I mean, like all in all, I think that's when I started to really get into music. So tough, but it, um Pretty good at the end. Where were you in 2011, Patrick? So in 2011, I was still in primary school. Uh, I was like a year away from graduating. Um, you know, I was <laughs> when you when you had to like go through the process of like selecting what school you was going to go to next. And this like 2011 started a trend for me because I never like I never started when everyone else started. I always started like two or three months after I should have started. And that has continued my entire Getting life. the game late. <laughs> yeah. When those were like, hey, we're going to go to like, I think it was Hilton or like Michael House at the time. Right. And they're like, we got to go check it out. And I was like, I know, let's have fun. I'm not going. <laughs> and then my mom tuned, hey, let's go check out this other joint. And I was like, oh, it's... Um, but yeah, nah, 2011 was also a weird year for me, man. Uh, but, uh, I think musically speaking, I still wasn't, wasn't deep into music. 
All right? Yeah. I've told you this story a hundred times, but my mom, she pay, she played me all the Kanye West albums. So did you I, realize <laughs> that you were a champion? She played all the Kanye West albums, and champion was the song she was like a beat <laughs> most. Because every time I felt bad about like something that happened with school, whether I was like bullied or um, whether I was bullied or I just felt bad because I, I remember making team football. I was like, yeah, nah, that that shit hurt. That shit really hurt. So she was like, you champion. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, 2011, funnily enough, was exactly 10 years ago. And 10 years ago. Jesus. Yeah. No, oh. Dude, it's actually kind of crazy. So 10 years ago from now, The weekend has dropped, had just dropped his probably... I want to say one of his best and most influential projects in yes. House of Balloons. And um, we're now going to segue to the actual story behind The weekend. Yeah. What's the story, dude? All right. So the story behind The weekend. Uh, born on February 16th, 1990 in Toronto, Ontario. Abel Makonan Tesfaye was the son of Makonan and Samara Tesfaye, both of whom immigrated from Ethiopia to Canada in the 1980s. Tesfaye was raised in Scaraba by his grandmother after his father left their family. And when speaking specifically about his father, um, Makonan, uh, the young Abel Tesfaye, I don't know why I'm not calling him the weekend just yet, uh, said, I see him for <laughs> we'll like a there. night. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there slowly. It's a, prog- it's a progressive thing. Right, but the weekend's quote on his father, McConan, was, I'd see him for like a night. I'm sure he's a great guy. I never judged him. He wasn't abusive. He wasn't an alcoholic. He wasn't an asshole. He just wasn't there. Uh, this is a quote via the Rolling Stone. Um, and describing his teenage years, he says it's a lot like the, the film Kids Without AIDS. Uh, I, found this, I found this quote like, particularly interesting. Is that like, you know... Um, Everything I think about Canada is based on like the like what they want you to see. So, you know, what we know about yeah. Canada is like everyone in Canada is so nice and they're all like super, you know, like everyone's nice. Justin Trudeau is a sexy O, so of course you'd want him as your prime. They're clean minister. and pristine, man. <laughs> you never hear bad stories about Canada. Yeah, they have such a great transport system. Like, you know, apparently Toronto is a smaller city than Charlotte, but they have more like public transport. So, yeah, you you, you hear a lot of great things about this. But I think uh, hearing hearing like hearing and reading these quotes, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is this is what happens with capitalism is that it's two sides to every coin, Uh, you know. For everyone that lives dope in Canada and all of these nice neighborhoods and these pristine, crystal clear cities, sorry, these pristine, clean cities, uh, there's a dark side, you know? There are people who are doing drugs, who are suffering, uh, who go through poverty just like the rest of us. And, you know, I I guess what I respect about the quote is he doesn't act like it's anything special. It's just like, yo, shit happens. Yeah. How do you feel about it? Um, I think it's refreshing, man. I mean, it's not very often you have someone uh, with the story of like, um, my dad, my dad left when I was a kid and I had to stay with my mom. Oh man, fuck my dad. I think it's really interesting to see that there are some people, even though they're on like the vast majority, that were still able to live their life without their father figures and not have that as a bone of contention with them. Because I mean, I find that a lot of artists in today's world, like if they have the chance to talk about their childhood with their father, they're always going to be like, oh man, I hate that guy. He left me and my mom's. I think uh, the fact that Abel is, he's able to take something that's, it's pretty traumatic, but I mean, like he kind of, he acts very blasé about it. I don't see that very often. I don't see that very often either. And I think like, um, you know, you're right. I think like a good example is Tyler, the creator, like easily. You know, he like that man has expressed hatred for his dad. Oh my god! Don't even yeah, you don't I even, don't even you can know if I would come track. back. Like that's yeah. murderous intent, man. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, so another thing I find interesting is um, I never knew that the weekend, like, you know, before this was descended from Ethiopia. Um, and yeah. then I learned, I, I, it says here that he learned Amha- Amharic, Amharic. Man, if anyone's from Ethiopia listening to this, I will I'm so try. Sorry. I'm so sorry. My pronunciation is so bad. <laughs> but yeah. Amharic, uh, and he spoke that with his mother and grandmother and attended Ethiopian Orthodox church services, which I find, I can't even lie, that's that's a weird image. Just, Very. Yeah, compared to, compared to like, you know, what the guy would go on to be in the type of music he, he's literally yeah. soon to make, right? Like coming up. He never talks about it, hey? He never talks about the fact that he's half, well, Ethiopian essentially. It never comes up. Nah, you know, and I wonder how people in Ethiopia feel about it. Any Ethiopians listening, please comment, <laughs> we... write a review, tell us why. Do you do you do you feel like your man should be shouting out Ethiopia a couple more times than he should? Should he have more tours there? Does he have tours there to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> right, because I know that'll come South. He has, did he come? To, did he come to South Africa at some point? No, like the shorties this side definitely would have let me know. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, all right. Maybe he just doesn't like Africa. Makes sense. Oh, <laughs> <she works. laughs> all right. Uh, yeah. So he's so in terms of uh, so in terms of the weekend's childhood, uh, it's very very important to uh just discuss the drug abuse because it becomes a very core theme in his music so according yeah. to uh according to the research that i've done he states that he began smoking marijuana at the age of 11 and then quickly move on moved on to harder drugs um he claims he shoplifted supplements such as ecstasy oxycodone xanax cocaine and ketamine which i think is hectic as hell um yeah jeez dude like GTA lifestyle before 15, man. Hectic. <laughs> There's a story I would like to share with the audience. Um, just just to prove how soft I was at the time. Uh, <laughs> but there was a time where me and Trey were roommates at boarding school. And um, I was very, very, like, anti-drugs, man. Like, super, mm. super mm. anti-drugs. Um, and I remember uh, Trey brought up wanting to go and do some shisha at some point we were um, young <laughs> we were young so i was very excited we were young i was trying to experiment and then i i was probably not even older i was probably older than the weekend at that point i was like what 50 yeah yeah about about yeah around there mm-hmm. yeah and i remember he said he wanted to do shisha and i swear i pulled out the book and i was like bro do you know shisha causes cancer Mm. I want to lose you. Don't go down this path. This is a gateway trade. <laughs> we had a whole, like, I had a whole fight with my man, dog. I was like, I was genuinely scared yeah. of losing him because I was like, he's going to start on this shisha. And then it's going to be, it's going to be downhill from there. And then. But you went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you went wrong. <laughs> either way, either way, either way. It, relative to that, I was like, like reading about that now. I'm like, man, why was that bitching? There's so much worse shit that you could be doing than like, yeah, than she yeah. should. But yeah, I guess that's just a part of it. That's just a part of growing up sometimes that you, you don't know about certain things to the fullest extent. And yeah, just I probably should have done better finding research. yourself. Yeah, I should have done better research on Shisha because clearly the page I went to was just trying to confirm. It was just me trying to confirm my my suspicions on some man trade the issues he going die. But yeah, no. So, <laughs> he was clearly he was he was clearly into drugs very, very early on, right? We're talking a man who's not even the, of age shopping. Oh, the weekend. Shop. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. bet you're trying to at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not you, not you. The weekend. All right, thank the you weekend. very much. Yes. Right. So, yeah, um, any man shoplifting a sub- shoplifting supplements like ecstasy from a store before the age of 18 is like, he's into that shit. Um, so, 
Interestingly, so I I, I want to say unsurprisingly, but I mean I feel like if you if you're a druggie, you probably can still graduate high school. Uh, but the weekend did not graduate high school and left altogether in the year two thousand and seven, um, and also left home and at some point decided to start living, just lived out on the street, um, and then eventually even moved town completely to the Parkdale neighborhood of Toronto. So yeah. Story behind the weekend to start off with, he was in a very, very dark place. And that it's is... a really ballsy move to do, man. Like to really believe yourself that much that you're willing to become homeless before you make it. <laughs> oh. He was dedicated, bro. He was dedicated to the cause. He had a vision. Uh, yeah, so and just essentially was looking for a way to start making music. So, Trey. Yes. How- a, a small little segue, all right? Mm-hmm. It, you might, it might have already been spoiled for you because it's on the document, but do you know the story behind The weekend's name? I've heard this story before. I'm pretty sure that you've told me, but I'm, I'm very bad at listening. <laughs> it's it's the, the, the reason why he dropped the E, right? Yeah, because his name has a peculiar spelling. Yeah, it went from The though. weekend to The weekend. Exactly. Do you have any ideas as to why that might be the case? Uh, the only thing that I can think of is like copyright issues. Well, there's a li- okay. Well, there's a little bit of a story. Uh, there were some copyright issues. I mm-hmm. want to take a gander what that might be. Very obviously trying to lead you into a, into the next segment. <laughs> yes. Maybe there was a band called The Weekend. There was, in and fact, another band called What? The <gasps> oh, what a lucky guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes. So, originally when uh, Tess Fay and his producer at the time, Jeremy Rose, met up, um, he d- with his high school dropout status, he decided that he was going to... Uh, sorry, because of the nature of how he dropped out of high school, he just said after one after after he left one weekend and never came home, this would be the inspiration for the weekend's name because his life was like a never-ending weekend. A party was just mm-hmm. going to keep going and going. Now they ran into copyright issues because there was another Canadian band also called The Weekend with an E. So in order to deal with the copyright, they just dropped the E and he became The Weekend. Fun little nugget of information for you. So this Jeremy Rose guy seems very influential, um, just because yeah. of yeah, just 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 because of how he was involved in the creation behind the name. So Trey, I'm going to tell you a little bit of some. I'm going to tell you a little something about Jeremy Rose. Please do. All right. So some things that you know about Jeremy Rose. Initially, a retail clerk. Um, in the in the in the United States, he eventually decided to move up north to Canada to follow what well, to follow. Um, I want to say his dream, but more or less like his his desire to make a, <laughs> his desire yeah, his desire his his but essentially just to follow his desire to make music with you know new artists. So he initially yeah. had had an idea for a dark R and B album mu- uh, musical project. And although he was looking at other musical artists at the time, right, uh, initially trying to pitch the idea to a musician by the name of Curtis Santiago, but obviously never really panned out. Um, he approached Tess Faye in 2010 um, and pitched the idea to him. Rose played one of his instrumentals and Tess Faye freestyled, freestyle rapped over it. So initially, what? not even, yes, the weekend was at oh, first. Okay. <laughs> Yes, was more a rapper than a singer in the initial kind of, um, in the initial, I don't know, in the initial kind of, yeah, in the initial conception of his artistry and his work. Um, And it led to them collaborating on the album. Now, it's interesting to note that Rose produced three songs, all of which were automatic dare I say, instant hits, all right? Uh, the three songs yeah, of the two... Yeah, it's made his career. Yeah. These were, like, shortcuts. These yeah. four? Or was it three? Four? It was three. It was... It, I think it was... It was yeah. three that we know of, and then I think he gave him, I think, four stems in total. 
So mm. they produced three songs together. The three of them were What You Need, Loft Music, and The Morning, all of which were mm. become sort of instantaneous underground hits. Um, and others which Tesfaye had rapped on, which were ultimately scrapped all together. Uh, Rose let Tesfaye keep the tracks and he produced them under condition that he would ultimately credit him for them. However, things kind of got a little shaky from that point on, all right? So, Trey, I just want to ask you first and foremost. Yes. Um, I, I don't think you heard The weekend in 2011 when these songs were dropping, right? Uh, so, no. Yeah, I don't know who way was Way too innocent that. for that. Yeah, no, no, no. I was way too innocent for that too, all right? Like, I mean, at 15, I was thinking that Shisha was fucking cocaine <laughs> so i was it i was i was kind of like unaware of that shit as well so when did you first hear the weekend um i think it was probably around 2012 2013 um that was basically when you guys came to the boarding school because i started in form one in 2012 then you came form two in 2013 um, when you guys came, you really put me on to music. I mean, like meeting you guys, I'd listened to music before, but um, when you guys came along, like you just brought so many different genres to the table. And one of the things that our friend Philip brought was The Weeknd. Um, also at the time, I think I was like 13 or 14, I thought it sounded cool, but I had no idea what he was talking about when he was, um, when he was singing. I was like, what the hell is this? But it sounded really dope, like the sound that he decided to use, um, like the shadowy R&B type movement. Yeah, I think it's also important, like, you know, 2011 was, I guess, I guess Canada was starting to come into influence with a lot of things. So uh, I think Drake had dropped, was it Take Care around this time? Yeah. Yeah, so he was dropping Take Care around this time and it was like, even like in rap, it was starting to become like okay to be like more emotional and to like give like you know yeah. more personal aspects out of yourself r&b specifically i think was still dominated by you know um usher chris brown mm. um you know a lot of guys who uh kind of like enforce the r&b stereotype of these you know have it all dudes like women coming off like you know like women and lovers coming off like um uh, conveyor belt like you know it's just endless you know there was no there was no real part that you could relate to because these guys projected like a version of themselves that was just so unattainable all right yeah. um so a lot of r&b at the time you know was not was not you know uh i'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find the words right now but it was not this. It was there was it was not this. It was personal. not this. Yeah, it was not this. Yeah. It was not it was not the music that came out. Um so yeah, how did you so I I didn't know what it was. I think I only caught on to the weekend in around 2015 when yeah. you were starting to, when things were starting to explode with the release of um, the hills and the beauty behind the madness album and i was like oh yeah shit this this weekend thing is you know it's it's, it's pretty good it's going on it's yeah, going on it's going on it's going on so i think i was like 16 17 around the time and i started to realize yeah. that, you know drugs were just drugs you weren't you weren't gonna escape it <laughs> yeah it was, it was you're not ex you're not leaving man yeah it's I, here for you um, yeah and i mean i started reading a bit more about weed so i was like okay like i've probably overreacted when that was literally the only reaction. reason why we started i mean like sorry like a quick segue i mean like the school system is fucked <laughs> they really did try to make like a whole like curriculum about why drugs are bad but all they did was just talk about the effects of drugs. And I'm like, man, like some of these things aren't that bad. Like weed, it's not that bad, really. Who is our life? I mean, like incorporating. She, she sold us on that shit, dog. She was like, it was yeah, I mean, like she was too wavy, dude. Yeah. She was too bohemian not to be smoking. There was no <laughs> way. She had like tattoos of wings on her shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> um, didn't you, like, didn't some people call her wing bitch or something? Yeah, something like that. It was a lame ass nickname looking back on it. But yeah, she had like the, the dream catcher tattoo on one shoulder and a wing on the other. And like mm. the wing went across her back as well. So it was like, so, and she, I think she was some of those, she was, she was, she was, she was a student's mom. So like, you know, yes. and that oh, smoked aunt. weed. Oh my God. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the oh, we knew, so we was like, yeah, she probably, she probably was down with it. She, she got probably, me so. Probably, I mean, yeah. The odds. Oh uh, yeah. Also, also, you know, when she told us about alcohol, she was like, yeah, you know, getting drunk is fun, but you know, just make sure you drink like a glass of water in between to stop a hangover. And I was like, this has been solid what advice. What are these teachers doing? I know. Like, <laughs> what are they doing but that's solid advice to this day man like that's like i guess yeah it's like yo you have a little bit of water to them young (laughs) i mean they knew like everyone knew like bushfire when bushfire came around it was like it's game like you know yeah like we know (laughs) (laughs) we know all right so anyway to get back to the creation of the album trey when this music dropped there was a lot of animosity between Rose and Tess Face. So uh, according to an interview that he did with Vice, um, Tess Faye and Rose eventually split due, due to creative differences. However, the way he details it is quite interesting. So reading from the interview, I left when he dropped the E, right? The E we are talking about, the E in the weekend, when that was dropped became a point of contention for these two, right? He was pushing to he was pushing for some things that I didn't want to do, and it got to the point where he wouldn't respect my opinion. He wanted me to produce for him without any of my input. And I was like, well, then what's the point of being a group? And he was like, you can just be my producer. And I said, are you going to pay me? And then I realized he was not going to pay me. And then I backed out and I was like, you can have those three or four tracks. I'll give you the stems, just take them, but I don't want to work with you anymore that it, I was really congenial about it, but I told him, just make sure you give me credit. And that's when things went sour. Trey, what do you think happened between Tess Faye and Rose after he gave them those stems? They became best friends again. <laughs> <laughs> no, they definitely did not become best friends again. Um, ah, damn. <laughs> didn't see that coming (laughs) so although rose was initially credited by a lot of the underground bloggers who heard this music when it was initially dropped so the original versions of all of the songs we previously mentioned um when this music was originally dropped he was credited and known about but as soon as he was given as soon as the stems were passed on um, to test Faye permanently, and he started working with other producers. For instance, he got a co-sign with Drake by the time, by that time. Um, he, and Noah 40 Should Be started working and producing a lot of this stuff. A lot of the things that could have been scrubbed about, sorry, a lot of the things that were Rose's own influence were scrubbed from the album, right? He was essentially voided and discredited in any way possible and this for me um hey, it just it checks like it it uh, hurts dog because these are these are bangers my guy was no, but i mean like me. come on dude at the time now that i'm thinking about this um rose said that like uh the weekend just wasn't um respecting his ideas and like i kind of get why he would leave i mean if a homeless person is saying his stuff is shit, why would you <laughs> want to stay with them? I mean, we also got to consider that maybe he thought it wasn't going to blow up. Uh, you know, uh, a thing about The weekend that we saw uh, a lot about is that, you know, even people who, even when his music did kind of start to catch on uh, after he, after Rose and Tess Faye split, was that, you know, they weren't necess- they weren't confident about attaching their identity to this music yeah. because they were so scared that people might not react in a good way to it. So yeah, like he he probably yeah, let's not put our name on this thing. Let's uh let's just call ourselves the weekend <laughs> and see how it goes. Yeah. It's like let's be a group. You know, people were trying to figure out if the weekend was a group, a girl, a guy. So yeah. It was a very, very weird time. It was a very weird time. Uh, so I think, you know, this is what I think ultimately happened. He he probably gave him those stems and he was like, man, that shit ain't gonna work out. <laughs> you probably bet yeah, that it wasn't. I don't really good. see that popping anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but alas, he was very, very wrong. You know, The weekend has just done a show at the Super Bowl, probably one of like the biggest 
events. Yeah, he's you the know. biggest artist in the world right now. Yeah, undoubtedly. And, you know, it's, like considering, I, I have to say, his public persona is leaps and bounds from being like unwilling to put your name and your identity to your music to yeah. performing at a Super Bowl and. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, it's impressive. It's impressive. So he, as 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 much as as much as we 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 got to talk about the O in regards to to how he helped, you know, kind of develop this guy. He he he, he bet against the wrong horse because the guy went all yeah. the way to the top. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> all right, so now we are going to segue to the actual m- music itself. There are a number of samples in this album, um, right? Um, there, so, and we're gonna just talk about these songs individually. And it's a lot of wait. beach house, man. Yeah, there is a lot of beach house in this tape. <laughs> there is a lot of beach house in this tape. It's almost like Rose didn't completely produce the music by himself. Um, almost, man. Almost. For a while, I thought that beach house was plugging this guy. <laughs> First one I want to talk about, right, uh, is What You Need, which uses a sample of Rock the Boat by Aaliyah. So, Trey, I would like to ask you about this song, right? What do you, how do you feel when you listen to this? Um, like with most of the songs on this album, I, I feel like I'm at like a, like a rave and like there's so many drugs, it's making me super hazy and like I can't really feel much and um like this dark aspect because i mean rock the boat is a very beautiful song i mean honestly like i could play that in front of my grandmother (laughs) but i mean the weekends type of stuff that's it's something that i'd keep to myself man especially something like this it's so sexually charged more so than elia intended yeah, so the way the music, so the way the sample is used is really, is really, really important to emphasize, right? You hit it right on the head, right? Rock the Boat by Aaliyah is a wonderful song. Wonderful song. If you have not listened to Rock the Boat by Aaliyah, pause this podcast, pause, ah, pause this podcast and go listen to it because beautiful artist, beautiful song, right? But the way that Rose and Okay, I'm not sure if I'm not entirely sure if Rose was 100% on this, right? But the way the weekend and his producers, we cannot call them the weekend, finally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> finally. <laughs> Test Fay was a little weird to say, right? Um, but the way but the way that the sample was used was that they slowed and chopped the sample and added like a real tone of menace to it, right? So when you hear the lyric, you know, I'm what you need what you need it's not about you know it's not about like want or like joy it's about you know getting the next kind of hit of adrenaline from that from like you know whatever it was he was on sex drugs right so you know very very dark very very like you know i don't even know the grimy grimy stuff right it was you know it's like we're really at the bottom here right um <laughs> the next one you you alluded to this earlier there's a lot of beach house on this right yeah. the party and the after party so originally this um from what i could tell uh this was originally just titled the party the after party like the normal after party was added later and it uses the sample master of none by beach house Uh, That's so a very beautiful song. Also, very different in the way that he uses it. <laughs> yeah, uh, very, very, very different. Um, so, in order to in order to take this to the extreme dark place that he initially took it before, right? Um, the so master of none, they increase the speed and the tempo of the melody in order to, like, yeah, I don't I don't know how to say this, but to, we're on a but, different drug now. Yeah. It, it, it's a different one to the previous one. I mean, before we were moving really slow, really hazy. Now we're on like ecstasy. We're moving now. Yeah, the party and 
the after party. Like the after party, I find is it's it, like it does. It there is a distinct difference between the two. Like you can definitely tell that the party was one song and the after party was a different song altogether. Yeah, that's but added. it it does maintain like that kind of. You do feel that sense of like you were just you just had an epic drug rush and then the after party is like. It's somewhat, it's still like the same type of energy, but the hype is still there. Like that energy, like it's died down a little. You're coming off like the, the, the what, what we are going to say are the drugs and you, but you're coming off it, but you're still there. Like the, the energy is maintained, right? So that is, that is a song in itself. Very, very like powerful, right? Um, yeah. The next song that we're going to discuss uses two samples. Right, and it's also a song with another double name. Um, right, House of Balloons slash Glass Tables Girls. Right, which uses Happy House by I I'm gonna mess this up the pronunciation by Swizzy and Swizz. Uh, I'm going. It, it's and it's, the Banshees. Yes, and the Banshees. It's going to be. I'll put it. It's going to be on the video. <laughs> For those of you who could laugh at my terrible pronunciation, right? And uh, drop it like it's hot by Snoop Dogg featuring Pharrell Williams. Uh, I'm a nice dude with some nice dreams. Yeah. See these ice cubes, uh, see these ice creams, eligible bachelor. Right? Yeah. So, Trey, how do you feel listening to this song, right? Uh, obviously, we've explored the, the drug elements about it, but House of Balloons is is something different altogether. I this, think, it's, I it's think this is the thing that really got me onto the weekend at the time. I mean, I'd heard um, artists, I think this is before I even listened to Jesus at the time. This is the first time I personally heard an artist have a song and then completely change it afterwards. I mean, these two, it's like day and night, man. I think <laughs> um, the tension between these two songs, it's insane. I think uh, the way that he used both of these samples, I mean, the melody, Oh, masterpiece, man! That yes. was masterful work. Yes, uh, I I really loved. Uh, okay, so obviously what they did with um, was that they reused the hook and echo of Happy House, um, and slowed down the melody once again to add menace. Uh, I, but my favorite part of it is where he repeats Pharrell's iconic lines from "Drop It Like It's Hot," where you know, because uh, because it's just like the he adds like the 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 dual meaning to it because Pharrell's William is I'm a nice dude with some nice dreams right and then the weekend is also I'm a nice dude with some nice dreams but I think I'm trying to remember what the lyric is I'm gonna go I'm gonna go look it up right now I should have done this in research I'm sorry my bad my bad <laughs> right <laughs> but uh but that is that switch is that that switch between the two songs you're right is very 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 night and day Right, like as soon as Glass Table Girls comes on, you also just it's not that it's less menacing. Moving on a different drug now. Yeah, it's it's a different drug altogether. It's like the variation continues, right? Uh I think I think I think I found it, right? Uh it's I'm a nice dude with some nice dreams, but we could turn this into a very uh but we could turn this into a nightmare Elm Street, right? That shit is like you know, that's not that's not what Pharrell was talking about. He was saying, "I'm a At nice all. dude." <laughs> yeah. was like, "I'm a nice dude with you know some nice like you know jewelry and chains and all of that shit, right?" I uh, let me show you a good time. He's like, "Yo, let's turn this into a nightmare. <laughs> let's go to Elm Street." Oh, jeez, my God, that that shit is that shit is crazy. All right, hopefully we don't. Um, Hopefully we don't uh, end up we don't end up repeating too much. There's definitely a methodology to do, to the way all of this was done, right? So loft music is the next song we want to talk about, uh, which sampled Gilla by Beach House. <laughs> um, slow down tempo of the melody in order to. Uh, add that menace. Yeah, to add that to add that menace to it once again. Uh, Lock music, it slows down a shit ton towards the end, right? Yeah. So I know the first when I listened to that song, 
I know the first like minute and thirty seconds of it to two minutes of it is in fucking insane. I'm like, you know, it. Yeah, I can't even describe it. It's like a penthouse. There are women all over the place. It's essentially like a scene from The Wolf of Wall Street, where it's just like yeah, I can imagine basically. everyone. Yeah, everyone's like in a loft, going crazy. There's like women who are undressed, just lying, passed out on a on like a couch somewhere or like on a balcony, and he's just there, like waffling through. Um, but the part, yeah, but I think the part where, where where it like comes down is very when the beat comes down and they stop using the sample and it just plays on is like I don't I don't want to say it's disappointing and it's extended, but I think like it's kind of like a rest because we've been talking about this album and everything is like you know it's variation from drunk to drunk yeah. to drunk to drunk. It keeps going, but at some point you gotta slow down. So I guess loft music. Is yeah, I think that's point. where like this still follows through. I mean, like at this point, like the drugs are starting to wear off. That's why you're kind of slowly moving now. Yeah. I mean, at this point, you've lost your superpowers, man. Like shit isn't as uh, gleaming as it was before. Yeah, yeah. There's, there is like, there is only a certain amount that's humanly possible. So loft music just get. I think it gets to the point where it's like. You know, you go insane and then you, you see the consequences of everything happening. Granted, right, somewhat controversial statement. I, I still would like to be in that loft. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Does your mom ter- watch this podcast? Uh, no, thankfully. Uh... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Trey, the last sample, right? Mm-hmm. The knowing. The video version, at least. So this this sample is not included in the actual album version, right? Was a hearty breakfast by Richu Sakamoto, right? Hey, wow, I probably mispronounced that shit as well. Just add it to the list. Um, <laughs> add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, but the knowing video version reuses the melody in the introduction of the video. So that's an interesting thing worth discussing. How do you feel about the knowing? Because I don't lie. Yeah, I think I think after everything that you get in the first. Yeah, I mean, I won't even lie to you, man. I, I guess this is really like w- what it feels like coming down from a heavy drug. At this point, like, <laughs> it's not bad, but I mean, it's just not what it was a few minutes ago. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. You're right. You're right. It's definitely. It's definitely a. I don't want to say like it's a letdown, all right? But it is just the song that I listen to. And it's weird because out of all of the ones, this is the one that got a music video, right? Uh, but it was the one this that This is I the only to. one. This is the only one that got like a real legitimate music video. Like one that I could find that was legitimate. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, you know, it's like... Uh, yeah, but hey, The Knowing. <laughs> it was a song. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Look, this 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 album is influential and amazing, and I love it. And there's a lot of things to like, but like everything in life, it is not perfect. It has flaws. It has some throwaway tracks. I think the knowing probably for me personally. Yeah, like yeah, it's, it's not a, a, it's not good. like a straight up miss, but I mean like having so many bangers back to back to back. I mean like. You're allowed like at least one misstep. I mean, he's just worked so hard for us without every other song on this, on this um, mixtape. I think just letting one slide is okay. I mean, it it also comes straight after loft music, so you're coming <laughs> down like lo- like loft music. As I said earlier, is like you're you're up here, up here. There we go. Yeah. And then you're coming down, and you come down for a really really long time. And then you go straight into the knowing, and it's like, oh, so we're just gonna stay here, um, okay? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is not great, um, but yeah. Don't you find it so weird how um, two songs prior to this, we have something beautiful, something sexy, something dark, something like edgy, and that song was called "Coming Down," and then we have the knowing after that. Ah. Uh, uh. I mean, I ain't bro. Okay, wait, just let me quickly correct you. It's coming down loft music and the knowing. Yes, and then the knowing, yeah. Yeah. 
So I think like I mean coming down is still a like okay we haven't talked about it because there's no sample that yeah, it's, specifically uses but it's still a it's still a it doesn't it's a necessarily sexy song man it doesn't it's a yeah. sexy song yeah it doesn't feel like you're coming down it feels like okay we're like slowing down for real yeah and then as I said the beginning of <laughs> we're about to re up man yeah. The beginning of love music does that, and then you're like, okay, I can't maintain this, and then like you know, the the end of the the end of love music and the knowing, and I guess twenty eight, they're all like it's it's very very shaky, but everything leading up is, it's excellent, right? Um, while we're while we're discussing these tracks as well, I just wanna I just realized we we haven't explicitly talked about this, but uh, perhaps the most famous song, uh, the one that has recently been performed in Uncut Gems, "The Morning," is uh, definitely worth discussing. Yeah, yeah. I actually this was for yeah for the longest time. I think that was my favorite weekend track, but that was just because like I was really basic and I heard like one play on words and I was like, oh man, this is crazy. <laughs> like, um, I think the line is like, got the walls kicking, like it's six, month, uh, six months pregnant and like 15 year old me was like, oh man, this guy's a visionary. This is crazy. This is because, insane. Because the baby kicking at six months <laughs> and the wall is pregnant. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. No, I mean, uh, I think, uh, I think it was a great song. And it's something that I can still listen to. Like, it really, it stands the test of time, man. I think it's, yeah, I mean, even now, I think it can still be considered one of my favorite weekend tracks. What about you? I think for me, um, so, one, when we were, when we, uh, when I was still in London, you know, pre-COVID, um, mm. I played this uh, to, um, I'm going to avoid mentioning names, all right? But I, I, I was hanging out, I was the hanging shorty. out with, with Eddie Gorgia. Um, previously been on this podcast go check out go check out life in the gray um and he uh he uh and it was me him and these two girls and i remember i played the song and it didn't really slap with them um but then we uh i I played it again when it was a little bit more of an intimate setting and we was like you know we'd had a couple of drinks and everything was like nice and like you know Everyone is just chill us and yo, bro. That should not slap. My God, I don't know if I don't know if our if our if our good friend remembers that shit because he was I don't know, he, <laughs> he was going out of it a little bit. But I remember that, and I was like, well, this shit was amazing. That shit was amazing. So no, it's a uh, it's not it's not a song for every occasion, but it's definitely one of my favorite yeah. albums. Right? Yeah. Um, it's 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 probably my favorite next to. Uh, house of balloons and i want to say the first half of lock music right those are probably and wicked games man because i know that like if people listen to this and like how could these guys possibly talk about this tape and not mention wicked games and i know for a fact like one of our friends is going to say that to my face (laughs) so i just feel like it's necessary for us to at least talk about that song or acknowledge it at least yeah okay no no no. uh we we will acknowledge wicked games just for those of you listening listen we only did the ones with we only discussed the ones with samples (laughs) and we we've only kind of like gone on to the morning because it's like a little somewhat culturally relevant because it was in a movie that was controversially snubbed for like the grammys listen this is a great tape there would be if we talked about every single song we would be here for hours upon hours all right and i'm not necessarily sure if all of our listeners have the attention span to listen to this whole thing because you know what we're probably gonna have to chop it up into bits and pieces um so trey final segue well penultimate segue right let's discuss the artwork all right now the house of balloons artwork is very very iconic all right it's It's iconic it's undeniable yeah um it was described in a review on pitchfork as an album art that looked like spiritualized cross with tumblr art porn which is an interesting description Um, yeah it works it, it works. works. It works. It definitely works. Um, also, because Spiritualized had a had an album that 
uh, I will I will put this up on I will put this up on YouTube so that people who are watching can get a comparison, right? Um, but they did have an album, Spiritualized, Ladies and Gentlemen, We Are Floating in Space, which, you know, same type of font, same type of like newspaper, yeah. uh, you know. Same like, aesthetic. Aesthetic, yes. Thank you for the assist. Um, yeah. Um, so the aesthetic was very, very similar. I think that newspaper aesthetic really sounds like, really like draws your attention to it because yeah. It's the weekend. It's like a newspaper reporting on the weekend. Like that's what I thought the first yeah. time I saw this album art. I was like, "Oh, what's going on this weekend, guys?" <laughs> oh, <laughs> like why is that lady passed out in a bathtub full of balloons? <laughs> um, I don't. Nece- I haven't. I haven't necessarily found anything about the um, actual artwork itself. Um, you know, there's no story behind it, but there is there. The, um, but the weekend did admit in an interview that that, that a house of that the house of balloons is an actual place in Canada. So I have a sneaky feeling that maybe the house was just filled with balloons, and there was a lady passed out, and he took a photo. <laughs> Just <laughs> he took was a like, of her. <laughs> yeah, and he was just like, I will well, maybe listen to the album artwork. Uh, maybe not. Um, people. I would like to think he just wanted this for the album artwork because it would be very, very strange for this guy to go up to a venue, see a woman pass that on the floor with some balloons, and be like, I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna keep this thing. <laughs> I mean, if the House of Balloons is a real place, I feel like he was there often enough where people were like, oh, yeah, sure, it's just able. Let him take some photos, like, whatever. He'll use it for his album. Like, who knows? Maybe you'll get really famous from it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Uh, so, some things I like to point out. So, uh, elements of this, um, elements of the album artwork were obviously censored, um, obviously due to... I mean, very graphic nudity. Although we never see the woman's face, uh, there is a little nipple slip. Uh, you know, I guess we can. Yeah, a little nipple slip that that had to be covered up on tape uh, in terms of its official release. But if you look up, um, if you look up any yeah, of the just type in House of Balloons and it's there. Yeah, it's there. If you're really that thirsty to uh, see it, <laughs> you could just type it on Google. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's the, the the balloons the balloons are very very eye catching because like I mean they are they are like covering up what we see but I've never mm. been able to figure out what the significance of the balloons it actually like is right because my idea is that like you know um, it's a house full of balloons anything is like due to pop at any given second um you know and like i guess the balloons also like protect like you know i guess it's like it's talking about like very fragile people so at any given point like you know you're in a house full of balloons so like at any point anyone could pop and things explode and we make a lot of noise right um but i could never i can just like it's such a throwaway comment i mean that's really deep that's really well thought out I mean, it's the only thing I can think. It's the only thing I can think of as to why I, I like. I understand maybe it's called the House of Balloons because it's like a party. It's a party all the time, right? Yeah. So the house is full of balloons to show that. But yeah, no, it's 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 very it's it's very very tricky. I I couldn't find anything about it. Um, but yeah, Trey, this album art is very very easy to replicate. So much so that it has been replicated by dudes online multiple times right so starboy uh people made replicas of this kind of format what oh, about yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. it yeah what about it makes it so extremely extremely effective in catching the eye despite very simplistic design i think it's just very jarring man i mean this isn't something especially at the time this isn't something that you saw very often especially with like an r&b album or a mixtape or something you never saw an album cover like this ever and I mean, the fact that he managed to um, maintain this kind of um, this art direction throughout everything that he did, you can see that what he did here, because he found it so not just effective, but I mean, the fact that he could understand why so many people would be drawn to this, it's very like it's obvious why he'd want to like continue this motif throughout um, 
the the trilogy of his mixtapes. And I mean, like, when you look at this thing, it's like to come in as an art, as an artist, um, like the, the tension between, yeah, you know what it is, man. The tension between the different sides of the, the frame. It's like, because the blacks are so stark and then the whites are just so exposed and then there's one figure down there at the bottom, like your eyes looking around this whole thing. And because um, some things are very dark and some things are very white, when you go down to the bottom, like when your eyes travel down there, you're like, damn, that's a woman that has passed out. I wonder what's happening with this album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it definitely, it definitely dra- does draw, draw your attention. Right, so uh, I just want to ask, is this the most effective version of this art? Because we obviously see it in Thursday and Echoes of Silence. Um, but I just want to know, does, because, okay, Thursday obviously has a lot more color involved, um, even yeah. though, you know, it's showing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, the lady who's there. Um, mm-hmm. And then Echoes of Silence has color, um, but I don't think it, it does what this does, all right? Because the black and white of it is just so, it just, I don't know how. the project. Yeah, it's reflective of the project. Oh my God! Um, so obviously we have a lot of accompany, uh, a lot of additional accompanying artwork. Um, this is all stuff that's found for the songs on YouTube. Um, so we've got artwork one, which is uh, a picture of a woman's legs next to a lamp in a, what looks like a hotel room. Uh, subject two, which is a woman a woman half naked, not even half naked, like three quarters naked at that point, because. There's no She's bra. just rolling around in her underwear, man. Yeah, no bra, just running around in her underwear. Well, she's not running around in this photo, but she's just, you know. Too high to do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know why I'm laughing. That's actually very, very fucked up. Um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, right. Um, but, you know, just a woman in her panties in a hallway. Uh, section three, which is Abel in a hallway by himself, looking like he's high as hell. I'm not even going cap to you. He's probably on major drugs. This guy is um, leaning against a wall, man. He's struggling to stand up. Mm-hmm. He's, uh, he's reached the peak of the party. <laughs> I think this is when this is this is probably when coming down. This is the photo that he took after making coming down. Like, <laughs> okay, we're good. Ah. <sighs> Let's, let's let's go to the next slide. It was like okay, I'm look I'm looking to get to the next thing. Uh, we've got a fourth piece of artwork, which is a pair of heels, an overexposed flash, and a pile of balloons, emphasizing the balloon theme. Uh, number five, which is Abel once again on a wall, probably the high as hell as well. Um, there is number six, which is a woman with a jean jacket on looking like she's stripping there's definitely no bra present here or maybe i'm just not a keen enough eye and there is a bra but who knows all right um and then there's the final number number seven which is a picture of a blurred out woman so trey as our resident art student what do how do these complement the original artwork the album artwork as we said is you know it's kind of iconic and how eye-catching it is. Um, this is yeah. probably the best iteration of it. How do these other bits of art go on to enforce and like, you know, like how do they go on to en- to enforce the message and like, I don't know, emphasize, emphasize the nature of the music? Well, I think clearly just based on like, when you link all these pictures together, I think this has to have been, um, this had to have been one photographer because when you look at the his use of black and white and his flash, it's okay. If you look at like image number three, the mm-hmm. contrast between Abel being like super, like he's covered in um, in darkness, like he's shrouded in darkness. There's a little bit of light on his face, but then everything around him, like it's blown out, it's exposed. Mm-hmm. It's like when you have images like that taken in such a I don't want to say like intimate moment, but I mean, that's not necessarily something that um, that you want to recapture or capture for the rest of your life. I mean, these are moments uh, when you're a bit too high to be present. Um, and I mean, like when he takes these pictures of these girls, I mean, that it's never usually like, um, like a full, I don't want to say portrait, but 
most of the time when these images are taken, they um, they amputate these women at very awkward places. Like normally, if you're going to take a picture of someone, you could either do it from the neck uh, to the hip, to the knees, to the ankles, or just like the feet. But here, I mean, they're cutting them in the middle of their thighs, in the middle of their backs, um, just the above their ankles. Yeah, I mean, um, all these images, I mean, also the filters that he uses, like this whole hazy thing. I don't want to make it seem like I do drugs a lot, but what I can say <laughs> is that this is very... <laughs> um, don't tell on yourself. Uh, uh, Mom, I'm sorry. Uh, it's uh, it's very visceral photography. Like, um, it's a very unique way of capturing moments at a party. I mean, no one is smiling here. There's usually only one person in the frame, and it's very rare that you see their face. Yeah, Abel is the only person whose face. I mean, not you can definitively make it out in five. Also, while yeah. we're on the topic of five, my guy really needed a brush. Holy shit, guys, yeah, help your man out. <laughs> like, too high, man. <laughs> nah, He's but, too high. Like, he, like he could have, like, really could have done that before he got to the party. I scheme. He could have just been like, "Yo, can, can I get home?" <laughs> But hey, you know what? Maybe he was homeless at this time, so you know. Yeah, living in parks, man. Yeah. What are you yeah. gonna do? Oh, what are you gonna do, really? What are you really gonna do? Um, but yeah, no, you you barely can make out anyone's face. Uh, I, obviously, I think that's intended. I don't think any of the women who are in these want to, you know, be identified directly. And you know, we're not trying to say anything about them, like live it, like you know, we're not trying to pass judgments on how they live their life. Uh, but it definitely is not, it's not something that you want to, it's not something that I think any, like these might be, listen, these might be very respectable working women with why, <laughs> with like husbands and children or wives, who knows, like maybe some of them turned left. All right. Um, we honestly don't know anything about them, but like, you know, the way that they're framed in all of these is very, very explicit. And even if you are like the most respectable of human beings, right? I'm not sure a porn star would be comfortable being framed like this, right? Because yeah. it's, it's it, you know, it's it's not just... Not very flattering. Yeah, it's not flattering. Like at least I guess, uh, I guess if we're talking about the way things are framed in pornography is that it's erotic, right? This is not necessarily erotic. I don't look at this and think I want to get turned on. I look at this and I think, wow, people are on shit. Like people mm. are hardcore, whatever it is that they're doing. And there's like, a, I guess I want to say there's a there's an element to it that just is, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's powerful. It's very very powerful. So I understand like the 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 the. the the necessity of the hidden identity. All right, Trey, segue to our last section, the critical response. That's funny. Finally on SNL. So after all is said and done, we need to discuss how this album did in regards to critics. Now, obviously the streaming numbers were huge, right? There yeah. was, I think it crashed that piff it had like 1,400,000 streams on that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's a throwback, right? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it had like a million, it had a million and like a million and a half streams and it crashed the website. And it was like, obviously the streets loved it. All right, like let's, let's not even talk about it. But the critical reception I find is important because just because, you know, like shit, I guess people like DJ Khaled and I think DJ Khaled is a terrible artist. Um, comment in the sec in the comment section, and you know, tell me how you feel about it. But that's my honest opinion. Uh, I mean, he doesn't even make the music, so that's like another part of it. That's another part that I take issue with. But um, in regards to critical reception, this album hit all of. I think it got like nothing lower than what would be considered an eight. So just to run through it. Um, so. Aggregate scores, any decent music gave it an eight out of 10 on it. So that's an aggregate score. Metacritic gave it an 87 out of 100. In terms of reviews by, you know, just independent sources, all music gave it a very kind of iffy three and a half stars. I'm not sure why, right? The AV Club gave it a B plus, okay. 
Uh, the Boston Phoenix gave it three and a half out of four stars, so that makes a little bit more sense. What the hell is that? I don't. Why only know. four stars? What <laughs> is that? I don't know, but I guess that's the way they review things. Consequence of Sound gave it four out of five stars. Uh, Drowned in Sound gave it an eight out of ten. Fact gave it a four out of five. Now gave it a four out of five. Pitchfork gave it an 8.5 and deemed it some of the best new music of that year, understandably. Um, Pop Matters gave it a 9 out of 10, and Rolling Stone gave it a 4, gave it 4 stars out of 5. Yeah, so I mean, like, it's it's pretty safe to say that uh, this was well received. Yeah, uh, it was well received. Yeah, there's no mixed waters here. I mean, this, this is clearly... Uh, it uh, changed the game completely, man. I mean, the way that R&B had been done before, like five, ten years, even the year before this was released. I mean, this is a complete left field. This is, this is like a Quentin Tarantino movie, man. <laughs> I mean, he really took a basic topic and then flipped it on its head. Yeah, so although it was well received, reading the review below the surface is very 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 interesting because there is a hesitancy to call this music good so some interesting quotes from the pitchfork review that i read right um in it it states the group's penchant for druggy atmospherics is mirrored in their lyrical content which is overtly sexual narcotics focused and occasionally downright frightening Debauchery is obviously nothing new in R&B, but this takes it a step further. The drugs are harder, the come-ons feel predatory and lecherous, and the general feeling is self-hating rather than celebratory. So, yeah, the darkness really came through, right? Yeah. Um, they also discussed the opener in a little bit of greater depth than we did, uh, once again, because we only covered samples. Uh, on the opener, high for this, Tesfaye Tefe, hand holds a partner through some strange sex ass, singing, trust me girl, you want to be high for this. Glass Table Girls is, criti- is pretty clearly about doing coke, because, because we don't know these guys, it's hard to say whether these are real life tales or imaginative storytelling, but you would think the latter, but ultimately... The, anom- the anonymity makes it seem more disturbing. So, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's clear that it's hard to call, it's, it's hard to say that this music is good because of the explicit nature. I mean, it's not for everyone. I mean, like, <laughs> it's definitely that's not. That's why I wasn't listening to this in 2011, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was not listening to this in 2011 either. And as I said, by the time I, I needed to be like, close to adolescence to actually you know listen yeah, to, to really get this and then even yeah. then i'm only really like starting to understand this shit now and i'm 22 years old dog <laughs> <laughs> like i i hear some of the stuff now like in in prepping for this podcast and re-listening to it i was like oh oh i i didn't catch that the first time i listened to that Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> this is this is worse than i expected <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, so the last interesting comment, this is a little bit long, but I'll go through it. All right. What makes this whole thing work in an album context is that the thematic and sonic pieces fit together. These weird morning after tales of lust, hurt, and overindulgence, bring the drugs, baby, I can bring my pain, uh, my pain, goes one refrain, are matched by this incredibly lush, downcast music. It's hard to think of a record since probably the XX's debut. Definitely a touchstone here uh, that so fully embodies a specific nocturnal quality. And even though the image of nightlife painted by The weekend isn't a place you'd ever want to live, it's frankly very hard to stop listening to. <laughs> this person didn't lie. They're, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Look. This is, that was a factional review. Yeah. That was a factual review. <laughs> I can't, I, I, like, we're, we're talking about this now, and it's like, I, I don't know who to play this for, right? These are, this is not music for every occasion, right? Even in scenarios where I thought people were, I, I thought it was appropriate, right? Like, you know, uh, in a party scene, you know, it, the, the, the nature of the music just, it can literally silence a room sometimes. And sometimes it can add to the room. It's definitely not for everyone, but it is, it is powerful. You cannot. It's it's hard to put this shit down once you really start listening to it. Be pretty ballsy to try and play this in a church and see what happens. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. 
if you play glass table girls in a church, oh. <laughs> Oh, just to scorch you out. There's nothing yeah. they can do. There's no spray to with holy water. They know it's not going to work on you. Yeah, even House of Balloons is kind of like, <laughs> like how do you, how do you make that work in a church setting? <laughs> this used to be like this is a happy house. Oh, no, nah, no, nah, it just wouldn't. Work. <laughs> it just wouldn't work. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to think. It's like get a choir to sing that maybe, and it might work. Like Kanye did with some of his music. But uh yeah. All right. So Trey. Um I'm gonna ask you to review this album ten years down the line, right? This album was released ten years ago. Um, and I'm just interested to know how do you think it holds up? Um Direction of this tape was visionary. The story told incredible. The character that we meet this drug induced guy that's trying to stop feeling stuff and he's um he's trying to hide his emotions through insane drugs constantly getting himself high as soon as he comes down and then having sex with women that uh is like it's loveless um i think i would give this an iconic out of 10 iconic. there will never be another house of balloons there will there probably never will be and you know the influence of this album is you know uh, i think we i wouldn't necessarily say we hear ripped off as such uh you know but there are definitely more r&b artists who are who have copied this kind of style of doing things the weekend has obviously moved away from it uh i think that yeah. was pretty clear when starboy was released but um I think, uh, but I think, I think Iconic out of 10 might, might just be the perfect rating for this. Um, I think we, I think just also because we see R&B artists who don't reveal their identity and like her, for instance, uh, still don't know exactly who she is, right? <laughs> Summer Walker has talked openly about like her mental health and her struggles and that isn't necessarily something we'd, we'd see. I guess even the guys we talk about, like Usher hasn't gone dark like this. Hell no, but... No, dude, that guy's just giving people herpes. Usher's really <laughs> struggling to stay relevant now. Yeah, but I mean, he did adopt some of this, so Hard to Love is, a, is, a, is, a, is an example of an album um, that somewhat adopts like a more honest tone uh, in regards to his life. I mean, considering that this is the same guy... Of course he's hard to love. He's busy giving people herpes. <sighs> Let Usher live, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being overly critical. Let's just remember. <laughs> let's just remember that Usher made love and love in the club. All right, that guy had to pivot somewhat. So that clearly goes to show that this tape is influential. I agree with Trey. Iconic out of ten is the perfect is the perfect thing to rate this thing. Um, seven out. I, it's seven out of ten very well put together songs. And you know the highs, the the high point of this album is probably even like the highest of the weekend's like career. I I will be honest with you. Like I don't know if anything he's done afterwards has really like hit the same type of high that he hit here, right? And I think what's ultimately sad about all of this is that we never got to see more of Rose and the Weekends work together. Like obviously you gotta vary to stay relevant. Um, and, you know, uh, it's clear that he had a, like, you know, with considering that Echoes and Thursday were not as well received, um, he clearly struggled to, to he, clearly, he clearly struggled a bit without, without Rose. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's just a shame. It would have been nice to see what a weekend Zodiac project would have looked like. <laughs> Please talk on that. Who is Zodiac? Oh, Zodiac. Uh, yeah, so Rose apparently changed his name to Zodiac as a producer afterwards. Uh, but oh my goodness. I, what a while kick to the balls. <laughs> your miss was so bad that you literally had to change your name. Hey, man. As I said, you know, it would have been nice to see it, but... Uh, this would be someone... the equivalent of, like, catching an L at school and then moving to a different country. <laughs> oh, it's tough man it's tough uh, i I, it's I, tough. I truly feel bad for rose and all of this because yeah just 
missed opportunity, man. Missed missed opportunity. He really could have been the forty to 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 the weekends Drake, but it didn't work out that way. Anyway, to thankfully back- so. I mean, like if he did stay with him, we probably wouldn't have gotten Kissland. Oh yeah. Kissland is basically like um, it's not even. I was gonna say that it was like the love child of this and the previous stuff, which I mean to a certain extent it is, but the drugs he's doing there, it's not as hard. This is problematic. This is Yeah, this is if the weekend was bad. my friend, I'd be worried for him. If if I heard this music the first time I would probably be like, dude, are you okay? <laughs> like seriously, like I'd be like, yo, Pat, come into the studio and then I play you the stuff. Like I'd play you um hi for this and you'd be like, Did you write this? I'm like, Yeah, man, I did. <laughs> Bro, you got problems. Are you okay? <laughs> Jesus. But yeah, all in all, uh, iconic out of ten. Iconic. All right, Trey. We have reached the yes. end of this episode. Uh, first episode of the Basement Underground. We have done it. Finally. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much for having me here. We'll hey, be doing man. the next one. Yeah. Uh, so for the listeners, we are not sure when the next Basement Underground podcast is coming. Uh, it's probably going to be more of the same next week with Gabriella and Pianca. But, but, but. 10,000 likes and we'll make a whole album for you guys. Exactly. We'll make a house of balloons for you guys. 10,000 we'll likes. We'll, we'll get coked up and just go crazy. We'll do it for you. Exactly. We'll do it for you. Exactly. 10,000 likes only. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, otherwise... What are we doing next on the basement underground? You want to preview it or should we keep them guessing? Find out next time on Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's it. Uh, Trey, thank you. This has been the thank basement. Thank you very much, man. Oh, shit. You cut me off on my outro. Hold on. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. All right. Yeah. This has been the basement. Yeah, thank you so much, oh, man. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> 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 okay, um, I'm I'll gonna... find a way to fix this. Thing. This is the underground.